Heavenly Father, we're just grateful for this day and the beauty and the wonders of the Lord God and for your loving hand that, that just keeps hold of us and keeps us safe and watches over us, Lord God, as we know you always do, Lord. We just come before you today uh, with just praise and thanksgiving, God. We just ask that your presence would be here uh, through this message, Lord God, and that you would put in people's hearts the things that they need today for their own uh, for their own salvation, for their own walk with you, for their own relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So I want to go to Ephesians chapter 1, and I want to start at verse 11. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. It says, In whom we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of Him, who works all things according to the counsel of His will. So let's start with that. In Him we have obtained an inheritance, having pre been predestined. The predestiny of God, having chosen us from the beginning of time, from the beginning of creation. Um, and we have been predestined, we have been pre-chosen, we have been selected according for His purpose. His purpose. We have been chosen by Him for His purpose. And... He works all things according to the counsel or the wisdom of His will. And His wisdom is based on perfect knowledge of all and everything. And so, we are given purpose according to His will, according to His wisdom. And uh, knowing that all things work in that way. We have been created that we could be saved, that we could be selected, that we could be used for His purpose. And I always, I, and maybe I talk about and say this too much, but I guess I really, I don't want anybody here to suffer from this. And that is thinking salvation is just get saved and then that's all I need to worry about. That's all I need to do. It is the most important thing, there is no doubt. But our love for Christ should grow in our, as, we, as we move on with life after salvation. Our love for Him should increase. Our desire to please Him should grow. And that is where his purpose comes in. If our relationship, if our knowledge, if our, uh, if our love for Him, if these things don't grow, I worry. I worry. And it's going to grow sometimes slow, sometimes fast. Sometimes it's going to be a lot of pain in the growth, a lot of struggles through the growth. Sometimes it's going to come easy. But it's... The process of life, when you love God and you seek Him, is going to bring about this growth in our relationship. And I, I often look out at the world and those who are unsaved, the atheists who don't love Him, and they go, they go through financial troubles, they go through work troubles, they go through relationship troubles, they go through illness, they go through all the same struggles that we do. But they choose to do it outside of the will and the purpose of God. And as Christians, what we're choosing is to trust in Him. Amen. That as we grow in our relationship and our time with Him, that everything, everything works within His purpose for us. And um, it's His good pleasure that we do that. His pleasure that we do that. It's pleasing to Him that we fall into that relationship where we trust in Him and we believe in Him. And we 
work in our life to fulfill His purpose in our life. And we care about that purpose. I mean, we're going to go through times where we don't know what our purpose is. And in those times, care about the purpose, even if you don't know it. And what is it to care about something? You think upon it. If you care for something, someone, it gets in your heart and you think about it. If you care for your grandchild, a grandchild, the thoughts and the memories and the, the, their well-being, it gets in your heart and it doesn't go away. Amen. And so it should be with Christ. So it should be with our walk with Him. So it should be with our desire to fulfill His purpose in our life. That it should get in our heart. And yes, as a parent or as a grandparent with that child, the grandchild that's in our heart, or that loved one that's in our heart, and we care about it, we don't always know what to do. But does that mean we just cut off that part of our heart? Does that mean we set it aside? Does that mean we stop caring? Because we don't know what to do? Absolutely not. And as Christians, there's many times when we don't know what to do. Amen. But don't cut Christ out of your heart just because you don't know what to do. Don't forsake having a desire to please Him and His will for you just because you don't know what to do. If you don't know what to do, you can at least want to know what to do. You can desire to know what to do. You can ask God that, God, I don't know what to do. Just open the doors and set my path straight. Because He's not going to tell you what to do in a lot of cases. But He's going to set the path before you. But it's according to His purpose. Christianity is about accepting that according to His purpose. Yes, it's, it's about the blood. It's about the salvation. It's about the forgiveness of sins. It's about all these things. But all those things should bring you to the place where you love Him and want His purpose. And if you're here and you're thinking, well, I don't know. I've never thought of it like that. I don't know if I want His purpose. I, 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 I'm afraid of His purpose. I, I'm afraid I might have to change too much for His purpose. I'm afraid I might not get to do the things I want to do if I'm doing His purpose. I'm afraid it'll be too hard. I'm afraid it'll ask too much. I'm afraid it won't be what I want. I, I want to do something bigger. I want to do something more than what His purpose seems to be for me. All these things. Guess what? You're not the only one that sought all these things. <laughs> Everybody has probably dealt with these same questions, these same concerns, these things that, that seem to make you afraid of or make you reluctant to or make you try to avoid His purpose. That's, that's our human minds doing what it does. That's our flesh trying to get in the way. That's the enemy trying to twist our thoughts and, and, and if he can't steal our souls he wants to twist our thoughts so we become ineffective so we freeze in our tracks he wants to stop us from that purpose that Christ has for us in Isaiah chapter 46 Verse 10, it says, Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will accomplish my purpose. I will accomplish my purpose. That's what God says. From the end, from the beginning, Ancient times, till now, till the future, God says, I will accomplish my purpose. Does anybody sign up for a bowling league and hope they get on the losing team? 
right? right? When you buy tickets to go to go to the baseball game, do you hope you, the team you're cheering for loses? <laughs> when you turn on football on Sunday afternoon, do you hope the team where you grew up gets slaughtered? A lot of that going on. In the yeah, right? <laughs> do, you, do you go out and say, look, I love basketball, professional basketball. What is the team with the worst record? Because I'm going to be their fan, and I'm going to buy their jersey and wear it every, every time they play. Does anybody do that? No! We're, in fact, I own nothing that has bears on it. You know why? Because it's been since the 80s since they deserved to have their jersey worn or their hats worn. Now the Cubs, they won a World Series a few years back, and then of course they uh, craftily dismantled their entire team, sold everybody off, made billions of dollars, so at least I will have one of their hats. You know, because I grew up outside of Chicago, so it was like Cubs, Bears, you know, and of course, uh, you know, the Bulls basketball. But, uh, you know, you're, you're, nobody wants to root for the losing team. I do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then this, this message has nothing for you. Because it says here, declaring the end from the beginning, from the ancient times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish my purpose. If you want to be on the, the winning team, get on board with God's purpose. <laughs> now you want to be on that one, don't you? Now you know where I'm going with this whole thing. Yeah, I don't like the underdogs. I'm going with the true winner. Who wants to bet against that? You know, the world wants to bet against a scripture like this. The world wants to bet out of ignorance, out of hatred, out of misguidedness, out of selfishness, out of their own pride, out of their treasuring their intellect above God's creation. And they want to bet against this scripture. Do you want to bet against the purpose of God? I don't want to bet that one. I want to get on the I want to wear his jersey. I want to root for that team. I want to get on board there. And even if I'm third string sitting on the bench, I'd rather be on that team than starter on the losing team. The game ain't that fun if you're not winning. Not this one. The only prize that counts is the winning team. And the only team that wins is Christ. This is a fixed game, people. There, there, there is truly only one team that's winning. And that's the one that gets on board with God's purpose. And yet Christians today... And this is... Been, I'm not picking on Christians today because they're the ones I know. I don't know the ones who three, three, four hundred years ago, 2,000 years ago. But I'm sure they had the same problem. There was this lackadaisical attitude about their relationship with God. There was, there's a satisfaction with salvation, and that's all I need. People living in the comfort of this satisfaction, I'm saved. That's all I care about. Don't you care about His purpose? Don't you care about his per? I mean, if you give, if you marry somebody, and I know a lot of you here have been married, do you care what they do? Do you care what they like? Do you care what they enjoy? Do they care what they want out of life? I hope so. You better. <laughs> I hope you have a like-minded direction when you get married. I hope you you have something in common. And what should we have in common with God? His perfect purpose in this world. For the body of Christ, for the local church that He has, we're in, and for us. Or else, why did you get in this game? Why did you get on board? From the beginning of time, His counsel, His wisdom will stand, and all things are going to work according to His will without exception. And guess what? His will will be accomplished whether you get on board or not. Amen. He's winning whether you are on the right side or not. <clears throat> he does not need you to get His purpose done.
I hate to tell you this, but heaven's not going to be any less wonderful if I don't meet you there. That's on you. It's all about that. His purpose is important and you should care. His purpose in your life is important and you should care. And I worry about Christians who don't care. And I worry about pastors who don't emphasize the need to care. Yes. <coughs> I mean, it's good that we, when we, when, when pastors preach, that they preach messages about being nice to people, about being kind. It's good to, to preach about all the good things we should be doing as Christians. It's good to preach about the attitudes. All these are great subjects. It's great. It, it's important. All these are to, to how we love and loving, about being forgive, forgiving, about about all these attributes, the fruit of the spirit. It's great. These are important subjects. But we can get into the Christian illusion that, hey, as long as I'm a good person and do all these nice things, that's all I'm responsible for. On top, He equips us with the fruit of the Spirit and He guides us to, to not be jerks, to, to, to not be hateful. He guides us for all these things so that we can be effective in the body of Christ, meeting the purpose He has for us. You can do all the right things, but if you don't care about the purpose of God in your life, in your church, in your city, if you don't care about the purpose of God in your country and in this world, in the body of Christ, where are your priorities? It should come along with that. It's, it's, no, it's no better to do all these other things well and to not care about His purpose than it is if you care about His purpose, but don't care about how you treat anybody. But don't care about all the missteps you do. To not care about uh, your evil thoughts. To not care about your bad deeds. Well, I care about His purpose with all my heart, but I'm going to steal. I'm going to cheat. I'm going to finagle my way through life. I'm going to kick anybody that gets in my way. But I care about His purpose. That's a lie. Right. Just like it's a lie, I love people. I care about them. I don't treat people bad. I'm a really nice person. I give tithes every week at church. Blah, 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 blah. I don't gossip. I don't hate. But I don't care what God's purpose is in my life. I'm going to go do my own thing. <coughs> it's the same kind of lie. <coughs> you can't have one without the other. Does it make sense? There's something drastically missing in our relationship that we have one without the other. And, 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 and what I get concerned about is that we have... I don't want Christians who think that if I'm just nice and treat everybody right, that's good enough. I don't have to do anything else. You see, I don't think this, these scriptures I'm reading allow for that. Hmm. Your purpose is not to be nice. You're to be nice along the way of fulfilling the purpose God has for you. Does that make sense? Amen. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 24. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 14. The Lord of hosts has sworn, as I have planned, so shall it be, and as I have purposed, so shall it stand. And as you drop down to verse 27, it says, For the Lord of hosts has purposed, and who will know it? The answer to that is nobody. His hand is stretched out, and who will turn it back? Nothing. His purpose, He has planned. Nothing can change it, annul it. How then can we not want to be plugged in to that purpose? How then can we want to sit back and not play our part that He's predestined us to be a part of. How can we want to just coast? Yeah, I, I want to join the bowling team, but I don't have to wear the shoes and throw the ball, right? I can just sit there and you guys, I can eat your fries while you're bowling and not looking, take things like your drinks. So, you know, hey, well, can one of you pick me up so I don't have to drive? Take me home? Yeah, and I want one of those cool jerseys so I look like I'm a real bowler, but yeah, I don't, I don't want to actually have to touch the things. I don't like them. 
Who wants you on their team? They got they got to get somebody on their team that actually can throw the ball. You only have so many members on your team. Let's get people that want to roll it. We can't have a complete zero. Can you at least bowl a 64? <laughs> and we're other men to throw the ball, but do something. Try. <clears throat> but so many Christians, they want, they want the outfit. They want to look like Christians. They want to wear the shirt. They want to hang out. They want people to give them a ride to all the events. They don't want to miss out. They want to enjoy the potlucks, eating the fries and drinking. But they really don't want to engage. They don't want to engage. And all those things I just talked about, that's all the bonuses of being engaged in Christianity. The shirt is because you're on the team. The potlucks is because you're on the team and you're an active member. If you're the kind of guy who goes to the potlucks and never brings anything, you're the guy that wants the bowling shirt but never wants to bowl. You're the guy that wants to get a ride to the bowling alley every Thursday night but has no intention of spending a dime on gas and he's going to eat everybody else's fries when they're not looking. We don't need you at the potluck. We don't need you down at the bowling alley. Let's get that shirt on somebody who's going to care about the goal. God doesn't care how good a bowler you are. If you throw 20 gutter balls, at least you tried. One of them's liable to bounce out and hit a pin. Right? But don't be the guy that says, no, I just want all... See, we have Christians that want all the fringe benefits. But don't want... Do. to do. And th that's not going to work. It's not going to work. Alright, so I'm going to go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, we'll start at verse 5. He predestined us for adoption as sons through Christ, through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. He has predestined us for what? So He can hand us a jersey? For His purpose. And His purpose is for you to get in the game. Play the position. Show up with an intent to do your best. Yeah, I, you know. Let's listen to that YouTube first, and then we'll move on. It might be important. I'm sorry, <laughs> picked on you. <laughs> I, I can tell you were surprised. <laughs> um, but it's, <laughs> it's it's his purpose. <laughs> you know, sometimes I just give my phone to Matt or Sid. Just I don't know what's going on. Just fix this thing. I know how you feel. I know how you feel. Um, and it's his purpose, his will. That's why he saved us. That's why we're that's why he called us. He did not save you to do nothing. And I, and I know I've talked like these before, but it's what? In verse 6, to the praise of his glorious grace. He saved you because you know what? It really shows how much grace He's got for saving you. Amen. Think about it like that. God must have a lot of grace for saving me. You ever thought like that? Or you think, man, yeah, I'm looking around and it wasn't nearly as much grace to save me as it was these other people. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a bad attitude. You start comparing grace. Look at yourself and say, how magnificent is the grace of God that He would choose to save me. Amen. It is glorious. Amen. It is glorious. And that's how much He loves you. His glorious grace. His glory. Aren't you glad His, his grace is glorious and not mediocre? Because if His grace was mediocre, a lot of us wouldn't make it. Because I don't know how many of us would actually fit into the mediocre grace category.
Because I think, you know what? I think we've all said enough that it takes glorious grace of God to get us to salvation. It goes on, um, His glorious grace with which He has blessed us in the beloved. He has blessed us, given us, blessed us with this glorious grace that He could bring us to salvation that us as His sons and His daughters through Christ Jesus and the blood of the cross that we could what? Be purposed and have purpose in His will. He, this glorious grace was to bring us into His will. All of His will. Not a, not a part, not a portion, not a little bit. Not lazy will, but in His glorious will to bring about salvation to as many as possible. Just like you. To share that glorious grace throughout the world. Through a multitude of ways and methods and circumstances and situations that we can't imagine always living with that will in mind. Because we never know when it's most important. We never know the subtle moment when we are living in His will that it touches somebody and ripples through generations. The ripple of God's will within a person's life can be long, can go on for eternity. Our little bit of life and the little bit of part we play in the will of God can impact a person and their children and their children's children and their families for eternity. Are, do you understand the magnitude of what it could mean? You don't have to be some great preacher to have that kind of impact. What if your whole life, you lived within the will of God and you only affected one person in that way. But that one person spread out down generations to their children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren, to the parents of many, many grandchildren in the future. I don't know how long this world's going to last from here on out, whether it lasts another six weeks or six years or 600 years. It really doesn't matter. Because God's got it worked out perfectly in His plan. Amen. But we all could play a part in the will of God in impacting thousands of people through time. Do you care? Do you want to be a part of that? Or do you just want to be, or do you not love God enough? Yeah, Alright, so, moving on in Ephesians chapter 1 down to verse 12. So that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of His glory. When we are working within the will of God, we, be, we, we actually become the praise of His glory. How is that? Because His glorious grace that brought us to salvation, wouldn't it be so wonderful if we could continue that by the way we lived our life and the things we did for God so that we continue to be a part of that Process whereby the glory of His grace brings about people into salvation? Amen. Or do you want it to stop? Or do you want to be a dead-end Christian where you accept the glory of His grace, get you in the door, and you don't care what happens to anybody else? Is that what you want? Is that the kind of life you want to live? Or do you want to be the kind of life that embraces the glory of His grace that saved you and you love Him so much you want to be a part of the ongoing process of salvation for as many people as you can even if you don't know who they are. Even if you don't know what little thing you did along the way. Even if God never tells you until you get to heaven. 
But I have a feeling we're going to see the ripples of our good things we did for God and the way He used us in His purpose in heaven someday. Like the thief on the cross. What a short story he had yes. that's touched people for over 2,000 years now. That gives such hope and will as long as this earth exists. His story will give hope. The ripples of that few moments, that short conversation with Christ and His salvation is touching millions and millions and millions of people already. And how many more? doesn't take much. And we may not see it like we did that, but we can have an impact. We can be a part of His plan, His glorious plan. I don't think God builds dead ends into His plan. That's on us. Ephesians 1 and 14. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it? to the praise of His glory, of praising His glory again. It's this inheritance that He has given us. He's guaranteed it in Him. Do we care? Or do we want to be a dead end? Isaiah chapter 43, verse 7, Everyone who is called by My name, whom I created for My glory, whom I formed and made, He created us for His glory. He saves us he gets us into salvation by His grace for His glory. He saves us with the blood of Christ for His glory. <coughs> now, do you want to live a life where His glory continues to shine <coughs> through you? Amen. He created you for His glory. Get on board with His will because that's where we bring God the most glory is when we are in line with His will. Isaiah 48 and 11. For my own sake, for my own sake I do it. For how should my name be profaned? My glory I will not give to another. His glory is protected for Him and Him alone. Keep that in mind as we're out doing the will of God. It's not for our glory. It's for the glory of God. God gets the glory. He will have the glory. He is selfish with His glory. Why? Because He is deserving of all praise, of all worship, of all love, of all glory. There is no glory without God, and He is selfish with it. Not because He's wrong. When I'm selfish, it's out of pride. It's out of flesh. It's out of want. It's out of jealousy. When God is jealous of His glory, it's because it is due Him 100%. And I want to leave you with one scripture and then we're done. Well, two scriptures, but they're connected together, so I'll read them fast and we'll like one. <laughs> Revelations chapter 4, starting at verse 10. The 24 elders fall down before Him who is seated on the throne and worship Him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne, saying... Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. For glory and honor and power. We were created, we were predestined for salvation, we were given a purpose with his, within His plan so that God could receive all glory and honor and power. Amen. I don't know specifically what anybody's purpose is. I hardly know my own sometimes. God has a wonderful way of leading us through His purpose from one point to another through His Holy Spirit and all the time we're wondering if we're going the right way. But He's taken us somewhere through all of that. He has a wonderful, a wonderful plan in the Holy Spirit to do that for us. 
I don't know what your specific plan is along the way, where your stop is, where you're not at now in that big plan, what you have in store for you, what you've done, what you will do. I know none of that. And you are probably saying, well, I don't know any of that either. i lucky if I know what I'm going to do tomorrow. Amen. <laughs> right? But I can tell you this. If you long to be connected and in line with His will, what better place to be than plugged into and have faith in the glory and honor and power that comes with being a predestined, chosen child of God. Amen. And that's who we are as Christians. Embrace the whole of it. Amen. Not just the salvation, but embrace His will as best you can. And I know it's going to be tough some days. It's going to be, you feel like you're walking blind. But you're not alone. Because we've all Amen. been through it. We're all going through it. And He is leading you whether you know it or not. May we stand. Thank you for coming today and listening to this rambling. I hope uh, something sinks in of value for you. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're just grateful for this day, for your holiness and righteousness, for your grace and love and mercy. We just give you praise, Lord God, for your will is glorious. Your will is perfect. Your will is just a, a mystery to us, Lord God, but we know through your Holy Spirit, through our love for you, Lord God, you're going to walk us through it day by day, step by step, Lord God. And where we falter, you'll pick us up. Where we get off track, you'll knock us back into alignment, Lord God, because we will seek your will in the darkness and in the light in the confusion and the clarity, Lord God. We will seek and want your will in our lives, Lord. Give us all that heart that wants to be aligned with the will of God. Lord God, we just pray for those that are out today, those who are sick in the hospital, Lord God, those who... We're struggling with illness at home, Lord God, those who may be traveling or such, Lord God, we just give, give you all praise and glory for your watchful and caring and loving hand upon them, being their strong tower, being their buckler in this time, uh, putting them under your wings, Lord God. We just trust in you and believe in you. Yes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.